Okay, cool. Um, so since we are supposed to get started already, um, I will start with another poll. So today's talk is about um, zero trust uh, with legacy environments. Uh, my name is Melvrick uh, from Singapore. Um, so I'll just cover briefly of like what we generally work with like, first. Mm -hmm. um, so today's talk um, is zero trust in legacy environments, uh, particularly for a lot of us that work in like uh, uh, big banks or fintechs or you know like e-commerce companies, like let's say. Um, your Lazada or Shopee, who, who have been around for quite a while. Um, so yeah, a little bit about myself first uh, from Singapore. Um, this is a view of our office, so we got a pretty good view of the city as well. Um, and yeah, today's topics is split across four fronts. Um, we'll talk a bit about like legacy environment challenges. Um, for a lot of us over here, if you're working with like companies that have been around for a longer time, then you will be familiar with like, some of the challenges here. Um, then we'll talk a bit about like data strategy. And um, actually this talk today uh, was initially used as a cyber security type topic. Um, for today, we'll also talk a bit about for Ruby, how we use Omni Off to help us enable bridge, uh, enable us to overcome some of these challenges. Um, then lastly, we'll talk about beyond uh, perimeter defense. Uh, which is a primary area of uh, legacy security for the most part. Yeah, so actually um, the slider question that I have over here that you can join also is basically a Q and A. Like you know, when it comes to zero trust, um, what are some of the challenges that you identify most with? Um, so the salary QR code for the main way or how the options like. Um, at the end of the day, then we'll publish and then we'll take a look at some of the results. Lah. Some of the answers that you see over here are also from a survey that was conducted uh, when this was done uh, during Octa webinar in Singapore as well. Um, so we'll share some of the results there. Okay, um, so what do we do just to give you context on like some of the challenges that we face? Um, we are basically a banking loyalty platform. Lah. Um, so you can use our points for like hotels, flights, booking, etc. Um, main thing is there's a lot of systems behind the scenes, and I think this diagram describes what we do very well. Um, so we are tightly coupled to uh, the different banking systems uh, behind the scenes to help them achieve this. Uh, so the whole high the like data, and the system is the most have ten to different applications. Um, so mainly from a security standpoint, right? Um, we work with a lot of different kinds of providers. So, for example, the biggest ones in banking uh, would be systems and companies like Ping Identity, uh, Microsoft Azure AD, uh, Forge Rock, Oracle, Okta, and so on. Uh, um, many, many applications, but generally they post around the same challenge for us as well. Um, so we'll just start with a quick demo so you can see like what's going on. Uh, so this is a sample uh, administration application that we have um, that's used for uh, a lot of systems and providers out there. Um, so firstly, if you see over here, right, what happens is that you are actually attempting a login. So give me a second. Huh? Okay, so this is like the first round of login, right? Um, normally, when we build applications, you just handle login and that's it, right? Um, over here, there's a second phase um, that I want to show you, which is maybe not something that we always do. So I'm going to demonstrate to you like an impersonation behavior. So after I access as a banking admin, right, I can impersonate a user. Um, so a lot of the big uh, SaaS providers out there like your Shopify, Squarespace, um, in order to do proper customer support, you cannot be building every single feature from an admin point of view, right? So usually you make use of something like impersonation. So over here, just as an admin, I'm already impersonating a, a user over here so that I can help he or she do whatever activities that we want to do. 
um, what you've just seen if we're actually logging in twice. So now I'll talk about like some of the challenges and uh, what that demonstrated. Okay, so with the demo in mind, uh, what you saw around impersonation, then we want to talk about like zero trust today. Um, so very briefly, um, since we don't really have a lot of time, um, zero trust covers five main pillars, um, how you continuously uh, protect your data, your users, your devices, your applications, and your network traffic. Um, the belief is that system to system, whether from front end to back end or back end to back end, is a, is a, we focus on continuously verifying the customer success. Right? So in a legacy environment, this is actually quite a challenge. Um, so why is that? Uh, for legacy, we tend to focus on like perimeter, right? Um, this graph over here, uh, attributed to Bobix, is just a sample uh, demonstration of all the way from your infrastructure to your supply chain, uh, which are your external supplies, and what are the different ways in which you know you can exploit your systems, right? So uh, your adversary only just needs one entry point, uh, but of course for you, you need to cover all bases as app developers. Um, so this is a sample redacted version of um, the systems architecture that you tend to see. Um, for this, I focus a little bit on the retail banking. Right? So this is a this is not representative of any specific bank in particular, but it gives you a sense of uh, what are the systems that are generally involved. Um, so at the bottom layer, you have your uh, servers, uh, your data, um, and any other services that you are using to manage the application stack up. So it can be mainframe deploy, it can be making use of docu documents. So this will explain upper, further up in the layer, you have your file, file based data, your warehouse, your uh, streams, your DDMS, and so on, right? Um, main thing is, as you start to go further upstream to your core banking services, then you have systems like customer profiles, customer cards, customer reporting, which is very important for, for the financial industry customer transactions, products, deposits, and so on, right? Um, then on top of that, uh, what we see as our consumer-facing app experience, then you have your internal and external orchestration services. So this can be APIs, files, apps, um, sitting over, let's say, like a service mesh or gateway. Um, and usually to manage identity, then you work with, um, uh, you work with the body services like your ping identity or forge wrong, right? Um, the challenge for legacy environments is some of this can be quite old uh, and usually there's, there's, there's multiple of these services uh, which makes it very difficult to enforce uh, like strict access protocols, right? Um, so I think previous talk we talked about CSR and SSR and about authentication between services, right? So you need to apply the same logic uh, over here as well, right? But with the older services then it's much more difficult. So, um, from a business standpoint, what are the key challenges? Um, so, I'll just touch this very briefly. So, this survey in 2017 on where uh, your IT investments tend to go to. Um, whether is it the front office, just the customer facing services, or is it uh, your back end services? So, um, that will be like your back office, like reconciliation, transaction processing. So, usually you can see over here. Uh, Survey-wise, in terms of where investments happen, this is usually more on the front office. Uh, your back office and middle office, a bit less focus on that. Um, so today is 2023, right? What changed, right? So same survey that was done uh, just like one or two years back. Um, so this is another survey on like Asia Pac banks. Um, so again, same thing, you notice that uh, modernizing like your tech stack is uh, still a core focus. So, after so many years, like this is still a challenge that a lot of services face. So this diagram um, uh, was picked up from an event like around one, two years ago. It shows you all the individual components in a mortgage processing system within a bank. Um, so every box that you see over here is an application or function, um, as well as services that are, that are used within the banking mortgage system. Right, um, the lines represent like individual interfacing, like data 
calls and transfers that's being made. Like. So this is really, really huge. So this is usually what you see uh, in older systems. Today, as we develop, then we want to keep things simple, so it's not so crazy. Uh, but this gives you an idea of just within one system how complicated it can be. Um, so how do we modernize? So first thing that we start with is always with the data. Um, so one of the big challenges that we face uh, is that there are a lot of like data sources and data is split across uh, multiple uh, services. So for example, if I just want to authenticate a user, it doesn't necessarily mean that the same data that you use to authenticate a user and then the next data that you use to, let's say, send an SMS to, to validate that it is the correct access, uh, that might not be from the same source. So, let's assume that the starting point is like a single password-based login, right? So for us, we always evaluate where do we start. Uh, who has the latest info, i.e. like which data source has the latest info, and then later on, then you can start thinking about like what are the key controls. Um, so for us to, for us, one of the challenges that happens a bit more often is, you know, we want to introduce MFA. Today, we expect this as basic for consumer applications. Um, but to do this for banks that were around for a longer time, this is quite the challenge. Um, so before we even introduce MFA, right, we actually need to find like where is that single source of truth. So usually we get this data from like customer profile, like at least when you want to do the login, right? But when I talk about, oh, I want to do an MFA and collect, like let's say a phone number, um, that customer profile may not have the most up-to-date version of that data point in that system. So we need to pull it from like somewhere else. Um, sometimes it can be from a separate service by their, mo by, by their mobile apps, uh, backend services. Um, other times, similar data can come from, let's say, like reporting because it aggregates it from multiple sources. Um, but if you can solve that problem for them, right, which is to help them aggregate all that information, then you can start to bring in some really interesting capabilities. Um, so one or more of modern aspects is uh, logging with, with like FIDO. Um, so this is where with your Apple and Google today on your device, you can actually, let's say, make a purchase uh, at, uh, like, at like Starbucks, right? And then you sign on automatically, right? So for this, you can do it with them once you start to, we can start to introduce this once you're able to merge that data, right? Especially once you get the device fingerprint from the customer. Okay, so the next bit is how do we add value back in the ecosystem by solving this problem for them, right? So um, one of the questions, this is one of the questions that I want to put in your minds, like, which is um, later on we'll see like how uh, through our implementations using Ruby on and off as a service layer, how we help with this process. Okay, so um, back to this diagram just now we showed like as a bonus, right? If I can actually help them orchestrate the different data points from the customer profile and from like the other services that I can start to introduce uh, other security layers such as a security Q and A uh, on top of MFA. If I have device information, even better. Then we can do something that's more file oriented. Okay. Um, so next bit for most legacy systems, we assume uh, strong perimeter defense. Um, but today you have the data across different sources, as you have just seen, right? So even if I have strong perimeter defense uh, for each of those individual services. If I'm being compromised over there on just one of the systems, then it doesn't really help. Um, so when we work with these banks or fintechs, one of the key questions that we actually have to provide to them is how do I give you a secure layer sitting on top of them? Right. Um, so what we are really looking for is like a trusted proxy, basically. So the goal is to go from like untrusted to trusted. Uh, because in legacy services, you focus on like a very strong perimeter defense. Usually, there's like firewall or VPN. Um, some banks uh, might even say, okay, we have that and we only want to connect to you over, let's say, a landline, right? Um, but for today's zero trust, for like continuous verification, there's not enough. So what you really want to go from like untrusted to the trusted plane is to pretty much perform like the role of like a trusted proxy for them. Um, in this case, really, we are building like a 
micro segmentation layer, right? When we work with them, that means before we are authorized to make those calls in to the micro perimeter below, but above that, for the customer facing applications right at the top, um, in between, then you have a policy and a data plane that actually works with the aggregated customer information and you continuously um, verify their access. So when it comes to us performing the role of like a trusted proxy, there are many areas in which we have to focus on. So before applications even talk to you, right, we actually go through an access control policy layer. Um, and this is backed by a front engine, which then allows you to continuously validate whether the customer session is valid or not, right? So if you are purchasing a coffee right now below, and then suddenly I see like five minutes later, suddenly your location has changed to maybe like how shop, then you know that's like impossible. So this is backed by the front engine behind the scenes, right? And that front engine then feeds on data from the data plane, right? So we have our ETL layer that actually works with the underlying services. Um, and naturally we also perform a few series of functions to actually protect and manage the data. So this includes encryption of your data, your masking of data as a, on an as-needed basis. Um, this, we find that it's actually one of those services that we actually perform for our customers quite often um, because when you have access to the data, it's usually raw set, right? But then when it comes to zero trust, we want to make sure that each service has the minimum set of data possible. So we actually help them to do that masking uh, action as well. In some cases, tokenization, right? Uh, for tokenization, this one, you can imagine it's more on, like, let's say, like credit card data. So these are the four key processes that we have. Right? Okay, um, now I think there's not really much time left, so I'm just going to skim through this. So data-wise, there's movement protection, there's classification protection that I just talked about using tokenization and masking. Um, there's role-based access control and that's tokenization. Um, Role-based access control, I'm just going to use this example, very, very simple. Um, we use JWTs or you can use the encrypted version, which is your JWEs. Um, this is the basis for communication of access across services internally. Um, key thing over here is everything is scope-based. So it can be by product, it can be by service access. Um, then as your systems talk to each other, then you validate this on the fly. Um, but what is not shown over here, and you can imagine is in order to do this effectively, then behind the scenes in your identity layer, then every service needs to be able to talk to it to do that verification on the fly. Okay, so essentially with that and your access control, then our identity services that is acting as a trusted proxy uh, is almost like a form of like a DMC between like our, our consumer facing services and the legacy environment below. Okay, so where we use Omni Off over here. So for us, this is almost a little bit of like our secret sauce because Omni Off helps us to simplify the aggregation of like identity services. So um, if you're a frequent user of, of like Ruby Omni Off, then you'll find that every time you want to integrate like multiple identity providers, then you use Omni Off over here. Um, here I just want to show you like some slightly uh, different ways in which we use it, um, which are maybe areas that you don't really see. So there's access level leveling and there is uh, amount account mimicry. So just now we show impersonation, right? So we'll see we'll see soon how this looks like. Um, so briefly for Omni Off, there's always like the request phase and the callback phase. Um, the code that I'll show you will focus on the callback phase because there is the verification layer. Okay, so um, for most of uh, so here, if you already use Omni Off, then you find it familiar. So you have your middleware that is uh, being specified or configured at your application layer. Um, as you will see this for Rails, you will see this for Hanami as well. So um, each provider in Omni Off is basically a different identity provider um, that you can actually uh, integrate for. So I have over here in the first line Google Off, OAuth, which you will see is quite common. Then you can write your own custom authentication. Uh, a service to be embedded into the only off middleware as your own provider. So this is what we do for our various banks. Now. Um, remember in the demo, I showed you how we logged in as an agent, and after that, how I, how I impersonated, right? So for example, for that bank A, then I have a bank A provider for the standard customer login. 
I've got another provider for the agent login, um, and I also have an uh, administrator impersonation, which you will see soon. Uh, yeah, so I think this quick diagram on the right hand side shows you basically how Omni off as a X as a as a builder that you can register. Okay, so just now in the demo we had impersonation, right? So essentially what you saw just now when I first logged in as an agent and then impersonate was actually a mixture of two different providers. The first one was the agent provider, uh, where I validated that the agent login was actually valid. Then after that I impersonated, right? So key thing is in the code over here, right? You have this line that that actually extracts out the token representing the current administrator, right? And then using that, I set the administrator ID before I merge in the user that I was trying to impersonate. Um, so while this code requires like a lot of like underlying service interaction, but you can imagine this is how we orchestrate um, during the how we orchestrate the impersonation of a customer, right? By merging the administration administrator info with the raw user information. Key thing in the session for most impersonation is knowing like which is the administrator. So over here, we actually set the administrator ID. Um, this is important later on because if you're impersonating user, right, I also want to have very active controls on what an, a bank agent can do on behalf of a customer, right? So uh, for example, I don't want the bank agent to straight away be able to change the customer's login email. Uh, so that requires some sort of access control. So this is also the policy train in which as you are assigning the admin ID is also where you can assign your access control issue uh, to the administrator when they log in on behalf of the user. Um, next version is the magic link. Um, so I think most of us here probably have used Slack before. So Slack allows you to log in with magic link, right? So we do the same as well. Um, so over here, again, it's token-based and we do a magic link uh, validation. So just to show you for impersonation, I made use of two different identity providers, right? For magic link, for us, you can do the same as well. Um, if let's say you're applying this for multi-factor authentication. So with the bank's identity provider, we first log in using the bank's identity provider to create like a first session. Uh, right now it's currently covered, but with magic link, I can actually upgrade the session. Um, earlier on, we posed the question, how do we fix like the data plane problem right, for, for most of our customers? Um, I'm going to use this example over here. So this is a sample like mobile SSO implementation uh, of uh, helping, the, helping the user log in our services using their, their bank's SSO. Um, key thing over here is, as part of this process, right, we also have access. So this one, of course, you need to work with your clients, but um, if you are working with them on like mobile SSO, then you can get like basically the, the, the mobile information that the user used to log in. So in this case, let's say for example, the phone number, right? Um, now, once I have that information, that allows me to actually resync. So it's a bit hidden, but it allows me to resync back to the bank's identity provider services, like the mobile information. So this is represented in this line where we do a check for whether the phone information exists uh, alongside their their, their, their bank's uh, customer information file ID. Um, so this is us acting as a proxy over here and helping them to actually solve their, uh, their, their data uh, sitting in like different places problem for them. Okay, um, so I think this sort of wraps up like the different approaches and the ways in which we use OmniOff. Um, Key thing they probably noticed is that we practice a lot of like dynamic access control. This is one of the fundamental building blocks to zero trust, which is you want to be able to restrict or limit access on a flyer based on the user's traffic pro profiles as they come in. So um, this is an example of um, some of the, the practices that we uh, and processes that we implement in the trusted proxy layer that we have underneath the hood. So you can check out, um, we make use of OpenID Connect, uh, which is standard for managing access control. Um, then with that, right, we have multiple services underneath the hood, right? So that requires you to actually identify, does your access allow you access to ABC services, right? So that's where the credentials together with the target audience 
the audience refers to the service that you can talk to. So for that, we have an underlying service registry as well. Um, only then you work with the authorization server to generate the customer authorization token uh, that gives you access to those underlying services. So if you don't have the, if your token does not ex expose the scope registered in your service registry for like cards, then your access, for example, should not allow you to then access like your cards information. Um, same process and framework basically applies both for your customer access authorization as well as your systems access. Okay, um, so this is a very simplified example of uh, Microsoft Azure's continuous access evaluation. I think they represent um, the dynamic access control approach better than I can in the previous document. Now. But you can also see over here they have the client, they have the provider, and then over here covered is actually the policy engine. Okay, um, so critical change scenarios we always take note of uh, when continuously accept verifying customer access, um, account deletions, whether MFA is enabled or not. Um, this one seems a bit like under the hood of fuzzy, but actually this is one of the critical aspects that we always look out for when we do our policy validations. Why is that? It's because usually if you pass MFA, you can do sensitive actions for the customer. So actually this is where we want to put even more focus on because if any agent or someone actually has MFA enabled, then that allows them to do things like add on additional phone numbers, add on additional emails, or even change your password, in fact. Right? Then that is when an attacker can start to take over. So this one is actually quite critical for us. Um, for us, also why it's a critical indicator is in fact some of our most serious attacks or cases that we face is not really attacking the system itself, but account takeovers for individual customers. So this is one of the common entry points, uh, or rather one of the common signals uh, for this particular entry point. Um, user risk detection, just like I talked about location, that one is one big one, uh, but these days usually you need to map that to actions like spending patterns, what do they usually buy, how much do they usually spend. Um, then I've got password change, um, similar to MFA approach, um, but this one a bit less often because first you need to pass MFA. So it's usually we look for signals around changes to the MFA. Um, yeah, then admin revocations as well. This is the administrators uh, being allowed to actively revoke uh, accesses or let's say purchases on a leveling basis. Um, once you have this five in place, you can be very imaginative with your controls already, right? Um, it might not be as simple as just like restricting access. My leveling over here can also be how much you spend, how often you spend, right? Um, if I detect that your risk profile is high over here, I don't allow you to spend more than let's say uh, 500 USD in purchases. So that's how we do it. Also, another way in which we actively protect the customer's accounts. Yeah, so I think in summary, hopefully you've seen um, for us, uh, together with Omni, of how we enforce like endpoint level protection and an example of like user leveling. Um, and also with the impersonation approach, you can see like how we also enforce structure on like a second or newer session that's being generated when it comes to uh, agent support. Okay, um, yeah, I think we just ended on the top. So thanks so much, uh, Coscup and Ruby Taiwan for having me here. Um, if you have any questions, hit me up anytime. I'm happy to talk about any topics around uh, security, ID verification, privacy, etc. Thank you. Okay, 谢谢你, uh, you can have a